it's really a privilege to be here. And uh, the last time I was on this stage, I was invited by Jess Search in 2014 to speak to documentary filmmakers. So I'm doubly honored. And thank you, Vince, for the opportunity to share um, a retrospective of 10 years of, uh, of solutions journalism. So um, SJN was founded 10 years ago to deal with an imbalance in journalism. Um, we believe that journalism's theory of change had a flaw. The idea that if we show people how broken everything is, things will improve is incomplete. Um, so what do people need? They also need to know what they can do about the problems. It's kind of just like a doctor's appointment. You want a good diagnosis, but you're really there for the treatment options. What led to SJN's founding was that in 2010, with uh, Tina Rosenberg, um, we started a column in the New York Times called Fixes, which was a reported column looking at how people were responding to social problems. Um, we reported over the 10 years over, on over 600 uh, initiatives to solve problems and what could be learned from them. And we found that, um, one, there are so many extraordinary stories that are worth telling that are undertold. Two, that these stories played very well. In the olden days, that meant being on the most emailed list or the most Facebook shared list. Um, and that they had real impact. I remember one story that I wrote about a Head Start program that focused on trauma, helping children with trauma in Kansas City uh, was so widely shared in education circles that it led to 200 replications of that program over a four-year period. Um, the value of putting out good ideas for the world. Um, also around that time, I had a very personal experience. My mother died, and um, my father, who lives in Montreal, was quite lonely and, and sad, and he didn't know what to do with himself, so he would stay up late watching TV. And I used to call him in Montreal around 11 o'clock just before bed. And one day, I remember his voice was incredibly heavy, and he said to me, Dave, I'm convinced that human beings are worse than animals. And I said, Dad, are you watching CNN? <laughs> right? He was, actually. So, um, but it really made me angry. And, um, and I thought, you know, hard, how could it be good or right for journalism to do this to people like my father, um, to highlight the problems and violence and corruption and meanness of the world, but to omit, or at least or minimize, the whole other half of the story, the efforts to reduce suffering, to prevent harm, to repair things. The news may be accurate on its terms, but was it the whole truth? And also, was it as helpful as it could be? Those were our questions. So we launched SJN with the mission to legitimize and spread solutions journalism, which we see as rigorous reporting that interrogates efforts to respond to problems and what can be learned from success and failure. And we had big ambitions. The question we began with was, how do you change a whole field? So this is our network today, a snapshot of our network. And these are some of the numbers that we used to count. We have shifted, actually. But the number of journalists that we've directly engaged with or have used our tools, close to 50,000, getting up to 50,000, news organizations that we track manually that are doing solutions journalism, uh, our partner journalism schools, uh, our international training partners now, which are growing, and now the number of countries where there are fellows or trainers that are advancing the solutions journalism model. Um, so how did this happen? <clears throat> and, you know, thinking about Vince's questions, what can we learn? We realized the early years were really all about building credibility. We had to show that we were talking about serious journalism. It wasn't, it wasn't fluff, it wasn't feel-good reporting, it wasn't advocacy, it wasn't stuff for the weekend. Um, and we figured that the best way to show this was to just have really strong reporting that would speak for itself. So we began by reaching out to top-notch editors um, who were enthusiastic to try something new. The first was David Boardman, who was then editor of the Seattle Times. He had joined our board in 2014 and has been a full co-creator of, of our organization since. With him, we launched Education Lab, which was a solutions-focused project that was funded by the Gates and Knight Foundations. Um, and together, we worked with, with their team and developed a process for editors and reporters to integrate solutions reporting into the education beat on a regular basis. And that is really what grew into SJN's core training program. Um, education Lab was supposed to be a one-year experiment. It's now in its 10th year. <clears throat> it's continued to draw funding from philanthropic sources, and it spawned a series of other initiatives within the Seattle Times focused on homelessness, transportation, and other issues. And there's also a network of other education labs that work together and 
and talk to each other regularly, um, including AL.com, the Dallas Morning News, the Fresno Bee, and the Post and Courier. Um, one of the things that we did was we also worked with news organizations that had strong investigative journalism uh, reporting chops, um, figuring that they would show us how to bring real rigor to solutions reporting. Um, so for example, we worked with two terrific investigative journalists at the former Cleveland Plain Dealer, uh, Rachel DeSell and Bree Zeltner, <clears throat> on a series called Toxic Neglect, which was looking into the city's crisis of lead paint exposure. Some areas of the city, more than 50% of children were exposed to lead paint. So the Plain Dealer had done two prior investigations on this issue, but they had had little effect. We asked the journalists why, and they said the policymakers just made excuses. So we thought, you know, how can we take away their excuses? And the solution that we came up with or together was, let's examine how comparable cities, cities like Rochester, for example, did a much better job protecting their children from lead paint and shame them by comparison, but also show them the methods by which those results, better results, were attained. Um, that made a big difference. In the wake of the series Toxic Neglect, leaders in the city's health department were forced to resign. The city staffed up its team, passed legislation, started instituting the kinds of warnings, monitoring, and certifications that had led to significantly better protections in other cities. We began, began to see through, uh, through projects like this that solutions journalism could do two important things that complemented traditional journalism could sharpen the teeth of the watchdog by removing excuses for poor performance, and it could turn journalist watchdogs into bees, cross-pollinating ideas from one city to another. And over six years, we engaged with hundreds of news organizations, and people began to uh, open up to this approach um, more and more. When we failed, it was usually because people wanted to work with us because there was a grant attached to our work. We've subgranted more than $10 million through our work over the years. Um, where it worked, it was always because there was an internal champion, someone who really believed in this and would fight for it within the news organization. That was a crucial learning. Um, in 2019, shout out to Jennifer Preston, we got a big opportunity when the Knight Foundation awarded us a $5 million five-year grant to launch 15 regional news collaboratives around the country. Uh, anchored around a solutions journalism approach. This work, which was led by my colleagues Liza Gross and Amy Maestas, has had a transformative impact in many regions where the collaboratives have demonstrated the ability to create sustained coverage at a very broad level with a focus that connects problems and potential um, uh, ways of responding. Um, each of these collaboratives around the country um, includes eight to 20 diverse news organizations and civic organizations who coordinate and cross-publish their coverage and bring together other resources. Um, so for example, in Charlotte, North Carolina, and Dallas, the collaboratives focus on housing. In New York and Michigan, it's been caregiving and now more health equity. In Salt Lake City, it's responding to the crisis of the shrinking Great Salt Lake. Um, one of the reasons that collaboratives have worked well and research has, has, has um, suggested this is because of the solutions orientation. And it's really that a collaborative that focuses extensively on a problems would just simply overwhelm people. But with the solutions orientation, it's more of like a, pot, a potluck dinner where communities get to examine a wide range of ideas and models for potentially dealing with issues more successfully. And it becomes more meaningful for the reporters as well. Um, over the past five years, we've seen the demand for solutions journalism really skyrocket. Um, and we've had to develop or evolve to develop many online learning tools and, and shifts to our approach in order to try to keep pace with demand. Um, we saw a number of things. Many news organizations wanted to use solutions journalism to advance equity in their coverage, um, to look for assets and contributions, uh, not just problems and deficits, especially in communities of color. We've worked closely with Trabian Shorters, who's on our board and I'm on his board, to integrate the insights from the asset framing approach into the solutions journalism model and, um, and with many other leaders around the country. Uh, for example, Deborah Douglas, who's the former co-editor of The Emancipator, now leads the Midwest Solutions Journalism Hub at Medill University, at, sorry, at Medill Journalism School. And she has said, you know, repeatedly that she feels that solutions journalism is the missing link in making journalism more inclusive. Um, 
We've also had, we had, over the years, we had many conversations with news organizations and funders who were particularly interested in seeing the solutions approach applied to a particular issue area, um, the crisis in democracy, as, as we saw from Angelica, climate and health and healthcare crises, and racial justice in particular that kept coming up over and over. And so we, we, um, this led to a wide range of SJN initiatives which focused on these themes and got really deep into emerging solutions in the areas. Climate crisis, advancing and protecting democracy, youth mental health and health equity, and building ra racial equity, um, economic mobility, faith-based coverage of solutions, a new initiative, and uh, we've also looked at how solutions journalism can drive alternative sources of resources. Um, today, our, the Solution Story Tracker, our hand-curated database of solutions journalism, has 15,000 stories from close to 2,000 news organizations, and it's a way to look for patterns and insights about how people are trying to solve problems. We're now using it as a training set to develop an AI classifier to automatically identify solutions journalism. Um, in the past few years, in order to keep up pace with demand, we've uh, shifted our approach to build capacity throughout the network. Um, we've basically decided to let go and support leaders around the world. So the first core is support leaders who are leading transformations inside news organizations or building their own platforms or feeds. The second is to connect them in a network uh, that we call All Teach, All Learn. And the third is really to amplify the solutions. And these are the solutions about journalism and the solutions that journalism is also discovering about issues like the climate crisis. Um, so to date, um, you know, the, the core of this is really to do a lot of listening, to come in with uh, a lot of humility. We don't have the answers. People are repurposing this idea in all sorts of ways around the world right now in, in the country. And uh, so we've been really learning from others. To date, through our Train the Trainers and fellowship initiatives, we've supported um, close to 200 leaders in 40 countries um, who are advancing this approach. Um, Two-thirds of them are women, and it's a very diverse network. Uh, we've also worked with 100 journalism schools, including many HBCUs, um, and we've forged institutional partnerships with organizations in East and West Africa, East and West Europe, and Canada, and others are coming along. Um, they've become the local solutions journalism hubs in their regions. And the goal, as I said, is really to build this network where everyone can learn from everyone else. Um, this past summer, four of the solutions journalism trainers who've come out of these projects with support from SJN and the Knight Center for Journalism in the Americas led the first solutions journalism MOOC, Massive Open Online Course. It had close to 2,500 participants. We were quite blown away by that. And so we plan to do a lot more of this, especially given the demand for specific trainings like carbon capture, sequestration, you know, looking particularly at how to, con how to uh, uh, hold companies accountable and at the same time surface innovations around the climate crisis. And of course, uh, uh, around election coverage is a huge need too and how to drive the coverage from community-based priorities and op solution opportunities rather than what the candidates want to focus on. Um, as this approach continues to spread, we believe that it could create new opportunities in the news business. Um, the essence of solutions journalism is to provide accurate, timely, and credible information that helps communities deal more successfully with their problems. We've seen that that's a product that's actually easier to sell to many people. Many of our partners have raised revenues from local sources that previously had never funded journalism. And as we saw from the previous presentation, there's a lot more funding for problem solving than there is for journalism. That's a big opportunity. Um, you know, as more and more news organizations continue to adopt this approach, there's also an opportunity for collective and collaborative learning that's very exciting. With AI tools, we've already seen it's possible to scan large sets of reporting and use journalism to examine emerging responses and answer questions like, how are farmers around the United States in different regions adapting to hotter, wetter, or drier conditions? Um, or, for example, how are communities crafting more effective responses to youth mental health issues? Um, there is ample research today that news avoidance, alienation, fear, and powerless are big problems. One of the pieces of research in 2016 showed that saying that 
people like me have no say was the single most predictive, mo most predictive factor in voting for Trump, okay? So building that hope and agency that Nia had talked about is really important. Um, so on the horizon, we envisioned the news evolving into a feedback system that in addition to its core about accountability function, also helps communities learn from others more quickly to get the knowledge they need to become the communities they aspire to be. Um, the vision of a world where we can get smarter together faster, where we can see people's care, competence, and compassion, as well as the uh, problems they're creating, is what we're trying to help build in the coming years. And we believe it's crucial to meet the unprecedented challenges of our times. Thank you so much for this opportunity.